Hello there. A very warm welcome to you all who are joining us this afternoon in, in Australia. I'm Mark Bowie, your facilitator for our August Centre for Palliative Care webinar, Enhancing Support for Family Carers of People with Serious Illness, Examples and Priorities. I'm Director of Palliative Medicine at uh, St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne, and also Deputy Director of the Centre for Palliative Care. I'd like to formally acknowledge country, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the people of the Kulin Nations, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. I'd especially like to pay my respects to our eld Aboriginal elders, past and present. As you know, they hold the memories and traditions, culture and hopes of Aboriginal Australia. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Peter Hudson. Peter is actually the director of the Centre for Palliative Care, and many of you online today may know him. We're an academic unit based at St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne, and a collaborative centre of the University of Melbourne. He's not only professor of, of nursing with the University of Melbourne, but he's also professor in one of the Belgium universities as well. He's got many years experience, over 30. We, we both hit that club, I think, in uh, palliative care, and his is certainly in research, education, and clinical practice. And he's won numerous awards and citations for the work that he's done, particularly around carers including the Premier's Award in Victoria and all for, for translating evidence into practice. And he's also won a Fulbright Scholarship, which he took a few years ago before the pandemic. So welcome, Peter. Uh, we look forward to your presentation this afternoon. Thanks very much, uh, Mark, for that um, warm introduction. Uh, and hello, everybody. And yeah, it's a real pleasure um, to be presenting on a topic that I'm very passionate about. I've been interested in family carer support going back probably you know, 25 to 30 years or so ago. Um, I initially began working for Marie Curie Service in the UK and the role there largely entailed going to people's homes for people who are towards the end of their life and providing some in-home respite to family carers. And uh, that, I suppose, sparked my interest in this area and I was a bit perplexed by the fact that some family carers seem to cope reasonably okay with an extremely challenging experience. However, other family carers seem to fall apart. And I was also cognizant of the fact that at the time there didn't seem to be very much research or evidence underpinning our practice. I was a bit, um, uh, a bit frustrated that we didn't seem to have any clear and systematic ways of providing optimal support to family carers. So that's led to, a, as Mark said, a big area of interest of mine. I, I do do other things, but... Um, the family care and support work is something I'm particularly passionate about. So great to have this opportunity. I've got a fair bit to cover and I'm going to move through these first three areas fairly swiftly uh, and use probably about half the presentation or so focusing on that last section, section four, drawing on some examples of work that we've done here at the centre in partnership with others and then importantly some suggestions around priorities for moving forward in terms of family carer support. Um, as you know, this is really targeted at healthcare professionals. I'm mindful there are some family carers who have joined the webinar. So thank you very much indeed um, for your time. And I hope that there's something uh, of benefit for you in the information that's conveyed today. And also a reminder to everybody that um, uh, although there's a lot of information I'll be conveying and a lot of slides, this will be available to all of you in due course, so you'll get a copy of every slide and the references that um, support various arguments and so forth that have been included. So um, uh, that's important that you're aware of that. So if you're interested in particular areas, you can you can look at those in your own time in more detail. So to begin, there are you know a number of different definitions of how we how we use the term family carers. Some people use family caregivers, lay person, uh, significant other, loved ones. There's a number of different uh, terms, but for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm really focusing on this notion that, that the person is identified by someone with serious illness or someone in his palliative care, someone with advanced disease, as the main support person for them, and that doesn't have to be a, a blood relative. Um, and it could be somebody who's providing physical, social, or emotional support. And I think that's important too that um, even if a caregiver is not directly involved in providing hands on care 
they could be providing significant emotional or social support to somebody with advanced disease. So they're just as worthy of our support as, as, in, as somebody who's providing direct hands-on care. So firstly, why do we need to improve support for family carers? And I don't think it'll take much um, uh, to convince you of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's helpful for us to orientate ourselves back to the kind of requirements for um, supporting family carers. So this is not an area that's, uh, you know, a nice optional add-on. This is core to palliative care and has been uh, really since the birth of the modern hospice movement and made explicit in the WHO definition of palliative care. There's a number of different definitions for palliative care, um, but this is probably the most commonly referred to one and the explicit recognition of uh, healthcare professionals needing to focus on improving the quality of life of the family units, the family carers, as well as the patients, people with serious illness, advanced disease. Um, and importantly, that that support uh, occurs not only during the, the period where the patient is unwell and the lead up to death, but also into bereavement. Um, so uh, I think, you know, just the, the key message here is this is core to our work in terms of palliative care. We know too, I mentioned by way of introduction, that you know, one of my concerns at the outset when I started in palliative care nursing uh, all that time, a long time ago, but um, there didn't seem to be much research. And in fact, palliative care for a number of years was kind of criticised by some, uh, you know, because it didn't seem to have a legitimate evidence base. Well, that's, the landscape on that has changed significantly, fortunately. And we now have clear um, evidence that shows the benefits of um, palliative care for patients and families and indeed the healthcare system. So, um, and importantly, in the context of today's presentation, those benefits for family carers when someone's able to avail themselves of the um, specialist palliative care, the multidisciplinary team and the, the high level of skills that are available through those, um, those mechanisms, then there are usually um, uh, beneficial outcomes for families as well. And this sort of recognition, there was a fairly prominent um, oncologist who remarked that, you know, palliative care were a drug and it you know, should be prescribed for every person with advanced disease. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the situation is that uh, we've got many patients and family members who are not able to access the benefits of palliative care uh, in Australia. So there are real issues of equity here. Um, and, you know, I mean, statistics vary, but some would argue that about a half, you know, more than 50%, of Australians who are missing out, people with advanced serious illness, missing out on the benefits that the palliative care can bring. There have been a number of reports, uh, Senate inquiry a decade ago, the Grattan Institute's done a report, and there's been state rep um, reviews in Victoria. There's two examples here, an Auditor General's report and a parliamentary inquiry. And there's been similar state level inquiries in other jurisdictions in Australia. All pretty much, unfortunately, saying similar things around concerns of access and also acknowledging clearly that we need to do more in terms of enhancing family caregiver support. And this has been picked up nationally by Palliative Care Australia, our peak body for palliative care. In its roadmap for the next five years, it, it also recognises that uh, we need to do more in terms of caregiver support. So we've got this, um, this mantra, the tenets of palliative care saying that we need to focus on family care support but a number of key documents and recommendations that we need to do more because currently what's being offered is not necessarily systematically applied and available to all. I'd like to move on now and, and, and touch on the impact of being a family carer and just to help kind of set the scene, a very short reflection from a family carer. So this is from Jessica who kindly gave her time uh, for a resource that we've been involved with called Carer Help, and I'll come and I'll mention that a little, a little bit later on again. Um, but let's now hear from Jessica just to help kind of set the scene in terms of what it can be like for some family carers as looking after somebody toward the end of their life. Um, in the last few days before mum died, I guess it was very much intimate family time. I was at a family home with my brothers and my sister and my stepdad, and the caring... I guess became much more difficult um, because mum was so frail and so it was actually more managing everybody else 
and our emotions around mum because she was just kind of in bed most of that during that period. Um, and so who was, uh, I guess it was my siblings, my family who were supporting me through that. So I guess, as I mentioned earlier, when one of us would be having a difficult time, we'd have some time out and they would take care of mum and be spending time with her. And so we, it was great having more than one person in that role because we could then share the burden um, depending on how we were coping. Mum was at home in her own bed because we didn't have time to get her into a more accommodating one. And it was in the middle of the night. So uh, we were watching TV and we heard her, I guess, calling out or being unsettled in some way. And so that went on her being restless like that for an hour or so. And then at the end of that time, she passed away. Um, it was a very confronting experience, especially because we didn't, not having it been around anybody who's died before, um, certainly didn't know what to expect. And I think perhaps that experience is different for everybody. I'm not sure how normal that was. Um, but we, we called the nurses and they came just at the moment she passed. So that helped us in that, in that time. But yeah, it was an awful experience. I, it's not nice watching someone die. So I think having the family around when she passed made it a lot easier to share that burden and also to share that experience. Um, and to, I think for us, it was important to be there for mum. I wasn't coping very well in that experience. We, when mum was restless and moving around, we thought that there was something else going on and that it might have been related to her pain medication, which had been adjusted earlier that day. And so I actually had a time out, um, as we do with my siblings and I, and my brother and sister were um, trying to administer her, her pain medication and so to relieve her. Um, in that moment um, and so they kind of carried the burden at that time and I just had a little bit of a time out and then the, and then I guess um, the nurses came and so we were able to talk through what was going on and they could advise us um, what was happening. I, it was just more not knowing what was happening that was making it difficult. In the days and weeks that followed mum's death um, I took on a, um, a role because I was one of the executives um, that I kind of was extremely busy actually organising the funeral, organising the memorial service. And so by keeping busy in that way, um, I guess it helped me through my grieving process because I was distracted and I had things to keep me busy. Um, I also um, went back to work quite soon afterwards as well, which um, helped me in that I was able to just kind of focus on something else. Whilst I was still sad and still grieving, I had other things, so I wasn't completely just overwhelmed by the grief, which I think you can allow yourself to get. Um, but I managed that. I, I kept on going to the psychologist. I'd go once a week um, to talk through how I was um, feeling. And, yeah, and I just kind of kept busy and kept doing things. Thanks again uh, to um, uh, to Jessica uh, for her time and to Kara Help for the team um, for being able to use um, that particular um, video. So thanks again, Jessica. And that impact is, um, you know, it's, it's an individual story, but there are some common implications of being a family carer and um, the in terms of general carers, so these are not necessarily family carers who are looking after somebody who is at the end of their life or requiring palliative care. Uh, we know that about one in ten um, Australian uh, community members are in indeed family carers, and they have the lowest well-being of any large group in Australia. So that's particularly sad to hear, and less than um, or just less than fifty percent and about half will actually have their own chronic health care conditions. So this is um, a, a major concern. In terms of the impact on family carers um, who are looking after somebody who requires palliative care, um, I'm not going to read out all these uh, implications about being a family caregiver, uh, but for the, the doctors and nurses um, in the audience, I would ask you to Remember back to the first time you administered an opioid medication, it was most likely, certainly it was for me, it was in a hospital scenario where I had you know, a senior clinician nearby and I was able to um, you know, seek support if I needed. But I remember being very anxious about it. 
Imagine what that would be like being a family carer, administering something like morphine to somebody at home um, and not necessarily having the uh, information and guidance for what is a very complex task for many people. So this notion of being unprepared, and I'm going to come back to that uh, throughout the presentation. It's a, it's a key theme within, within today's webinar. Many family carers also feel um, extremely lonely. And again, I've asked you to reflect on the last time you felt lonely and just um, how, how difficult that makes you feel and uh, how flat that can make you feel sometimes. Well, imagine for a minute being a family carer. Some family carers take on this role for many years. Um, so having those regular feelings of loneliness uh, and this can also occur even if somebody is in an inpatient facility, it's not necessarily feeling lonely within the, the um, uh, community setting, it can be in both scenarios where family carers can feel particularly lonely. It seems based on quite a bit of research now too that um, about a third of family carers are at risk of poor psychosocial uh, outcomes. So uh, about a third are going to be at risk of depression or anxiety. Uh, and these are people, the research that we've undertaken um, has shown that this is occurring even within those family carers have been referred to specialist palliative care. So a real worry um, that we don't um, uh, also necessarily have systems in place to, to support those people who are not accessing, accessing palliative care so their wellbeing is probably further compromised. A key message from today, however, is that I don't want you to feel that uh, caregiving is inherently uh, dangerous and, and distressing and so in, in short I don't want to pathologise the caregiving role. In the, in the most part uh, family carers can see uh, positive aspects associated with their role. So if you were uh, uh, all family carers in this audience and I asked you to put up your hand if you could acknowledge anything positive at all in your current experience or if you're reflecting back, uh, if you're in bereavement, you know, could you think about in the past, could you identify anything positive? The overwhelming majority of you would put up your hand and say, yes, I can. Um, so uh, it's just a really important thing for us to acknowledge that, you know, most family carers, there are some positive aspects to this, including there's some examples on this slide, but um, some feel it's added meaning to their life and they've got to know the person they're caring for at a much deeper level. So I've spoken a bit about um, why we need to improve support for family carers, what the typical implications are, um, and also now moving on to what are the needs of family carers. So similarly with um, the story from Jessica, uh, everybody's needs will vary, but there are some commonalities amongst caregivers uh, with regards to their typical needs. And I'm referring here to a, a study conducted by David Marco a colleague at our centre led this systematic review and it really highlighted that looking at a number of different studies, a number of other review papers, that the needs seem to cluster around three areas, around information, around psychosocial support and around giving practical advice. And these kind of um, lead to this notion that I, I touched on earlier, this notion of helping to enable family carers to feel prepared uh, we know um, that um, you know, family caregivers you know, uh, are often sleep deprived. Um, they've got a very challenging experience going on. So their capacity to retain, digest um, and use information can be compromised. So we need to think about giving information in biteable chunks uh, and also acknowledging that we need to give it in a variety of formats. We all learn in different ways as adults and similarly so do caregivers. So we can't just be relying on verbal information and we need to be thinking about um, other resources, you know, videos and written resources as well. The second study on this slide um, was also uh, confirmed through David's work that he led um, and it acknowledged that the needs seem to be similar across disease groups. So this the needs for information, social support and practical advice need to be, seem to be common amongst the various diseases. However, that doesn't mean that information and guidance doesn't need to be nuanced. As you all know, uh, the symptoms and trajectory for somebody with motor neurone disease, for example, will differ significantly for somebody um, who has pancreatic cancer. 
So moving now to the last part of the presentation, and I've broken this up into two sections. So the first is looking at um, some examples of how we might improve support. And what I'm going to do here is draw from some select examples from a program that we've undertaken at the Centre for Palliative Care. But I need to acknowledge this is, this is work that's been done with not only people internally at the Centre for Palliative Care, but with others locally, state level, national and internationally. And I do need to recognise the, um, the value of that multidisciplinary uh, approach and that's so, so important when we're conducting research in this field. And also very importantly acknowledge the uh, valuable contribution uh, that family carers have made to this body of work. Indeed, without them, uh, this this wouldn't have wouldn't have occurred. So um, their time and and their input has been absolutely crucial and commendable. Particularly as many of them doing it and providing that sort of information and feedback whilst they're looking up to somebody who needed palliative care or indeed during bereavement. This next quote I think reinforces again this point I'm making about you know, needing to feel prepared. Uh, this quote is from some time ago. However, it's still pertinent today. There's still a large body of research uh, that others have undertaken that show there are big gaps in terms of the quality of information and preparedness um, for caregiving uh, that's occurring in Australia, even in settings where palliative care is provided um, in particularly um, uh, comprehensive ways, so there's still gaps. Uh, so this is something that does need to be addressed in this program of work um, around uh, focusing on preparing family carers really stems from some seminar work undertaken by Hebert and others back in about 2008 and there's some more recent examples there on the, on the uh, slide from that um, uh, paper from Psycho-Oncology about the implications of preparing family carers and the benefits that, that can do, uh, that can bring about and indeed it can reduce the amount of psychosocial suffering that might otherwise occur. And we know that you know most family carers want to be enabled to make decisions, but they need information to be enabled to prepare better for the role looking after somebody who requires palliative care. So onto some of these select examples, I'm, I'm going to move through them very quickly. Um, and just to reinforce again that you'll have access to copies of these slides and then these references, so you're welcome to look at these in more detail in your own time. But this first uh, study was a group education program uh, undertaken in community palliative care whereby the local palliative care service provided three sessions, three structured sessions to primary family caregivers who were looking after somebody requiring palliative care at home. Uh, the program was a, was a structured educational program and it showed that um, family carers who undertook this actually felt more prepared, they felt more competent, which is commonly an issue for uh, family carers. They sometimes feel unsure about whether or not they're actually doing a good job. Um, so the fact that they felt more competent was a good thing. Many of them um, could actually identify some positive aspects and it showed that uh, by and large they had less unmet needs than those who didn't go through the through the program. Another project, the difference here, however, was that this is a one-to-one -one interventional strategy. So this is where a palliative care nurse visited the primary family caregiver at home and um, provided similar ingredients to the group education program, but in a in a one-to-one -one format in the patient's home uh, with the with the primary family caregiver in isolation. And this is a large controlled trial and it showed again that through this mechanism that the family carers felt more prepared and more competent. And importantly, uh, these benefits seem to be sustained over time so that those who actually received this strategy uh, were less distressed uh, during bereavement about two months after the death of the person they were looking after than those who received standard palliative care. So this is a, you know, it's a not particularly resource intensive approach, but um, seem to bring about benefits. Recent study we've undertaken, again, with multiple colleagues throughout Australia, um, and this was in three large hospitals. Uh, you know, family, me family meetings are commonplace in palliative care, but unfortunately the evidence didn't really show 
whether there were significant benefits indeed for patients or for family caregivers or the healthcare system. So through this structured family meeting process that we embarked upon and through this trial, we're able to show that caregivers who were part of these family meetings felt more prepared and they had less psychological distress than those um, patients and family members who received standard palliative care support within the participating hospitals. On to a study now that we don't have results, it's, it's, it's uh, just starting off. I'm very fortunate to work with colleagues um, in Europe and it's a European Union funded trial uh, that's involving six countries and we've recently got some funding for the National Health and Medical Research Council to run that uh, an arm of that study in Australia, which is really exciting. But the reason why I'm bringing it up today is it's, it's, a, it's distinction from the previous uh, interventions or strategies that I've just highlighted. Um, the distinction is that in this case, uh, the intervention or strategy is delivered via e-health or via the web, and there's a growing body of literature showing that um, these types of approaches in some circumstances can be as good as in-person or over-the-phone type consultations or approaches of this ilk. The other distinction here is that the approach is in this study is we're looking at the patient and family caregiver uh, together. So they actually undertake the sessions within the program as a dyad. And there's, a, again, a body of research that's showing uh, if people work together through a challenging experience, then they can typically um, respond more favourably to the experience and have um, less negative psychosocial outcomes as a consequence. But important point to acknowledge that these kind of dyadic approaches with patient care together aren't necessarily for everybody. You know, as you well know, there, there are some family carers who are looking after somebody uh, who they may not necessarily have a particularly loving relationship with. In fact, it might be a quite fractured relationship. So in those instances, these types of approaches need to be considered and it might be better considering a one-on-one -on -one, uh, caregiver and healthcare professional type approach. Very briefly, some resources that may be of value to you. So uh, again, with, with multiple colleagues and acknowledging their input, some guidelines and standards for, for practice in terms of psychosocial support for family carers within the context of palliative care and including uh, bereavement, which I think is unfortunately um, an area which is really um, needs a lot more focus. Uh, again, it's one of the key elements of contemporary palliative care within standards and so forth, but we're, we're really lacking systematic approaches to bereavement assessment and response. I mean, there are pockets of really uh, exceptional work, but that needs to be replicated uh, throughout multiple services throughout Australia. So those resources are there again for those who are interested to digest in your own time. The final resource or example from that program of work is the one that I touched on before with Jessica's reflection. And this is Carer Helps. This is a national web-based initiative and a big shout out to Tina Thomas, Di Saywood and Mark Bowie who have been directly involved in the next iteration of this, which is really uh, enabling this to be diversified to to um, vulnerable groups uh, throughout Australia and different uh, cultural groups throughout Australia. But the intent here was a recognition that, you know, being cognizant of the fact that said that many Australians are missing out on access to palliative care, this was a, a mechanism by which people could actually access reliable evidence-based information. And our research showed us that most carers wanted to have more explicit information about what to do at the end of someone's life and that that seemed to be lacking. There seemed to be a lot of disease-specific information that was available, a lot of information on palliative care broadly, but really not much about on the specifics in terms of how do you prepare for somebody, uh, prepare in terms of the implications of somebody who's getting close to death, how do you manage those situations, what are the options, and what are the types of supports available. So this has been taken up with quite a bit of interest, and, um, uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you perhaps to have a look. So moving on to the, the final part of the presentation, and this, is, this relates to uh, what I believe are really the priorities for us um, if we're serious about improving family support and in enhancing the wellbeing of family carers, then I argue that really we need to be undertaking these five things, and that we do need this multi-pronged approach. I'll touch on each of these kind of uh, briefly in the uh, remaining time, but just to to highlight 
in particular before I do the importance, and I think this is changing now, um, the importance uh, of engagement with the public and, um, and with consumers. And um, there's been some other countries that are kind of taking a bit of lead on this. And now in palliative care, this is starting to happen. And I think this is crucial uh, that we do have much more engagement with consumers to inform research, training and clinical practice. Uh, and the public have a lot of misconceptions about what palliative care is and what it might mean to be a family carer. So if any, any um, ways we can encourage that more, I think would be admirable. But let's go on to some other examples. In terms of policies and standards, you know, we now have accreditation standards for hospitals in Australia, so we're required to provide quality palliative and end-of-life care. There have been movements more recently by the Lancet Commission to recognise the importance of reconceptualising um, palliative care and end-of-life care, not just um, making it the remit of, of healthcare professionals. Again, acknowledgement of the importance of public engagement, of um, the sociological uh, implications of death and dying, and the strong um, work that's being undertaken uh, linked to the WHO around ensuring that palliative care is, is seen as a human right. And impressively, I think, um, from Palliative Care Australia very recently, I mean, Palliative Care Australia has always, uh, since its birth, has, has had you know, developed standards for palliative care within Australia and acknowledged formally the need to support family carers but these more recent standards in recognition that not all people who require palliative care need specialist palliative care in the bulk of, of, of care for people uh, with advanced diseases occurring outside specialist palliative care. So these standards for generalist healthcare providers and for aged care services, I think are gonna be particularly valuable. But in both sets of standards, there's a recognition that family care needs need um, uh, to be assessed and there needs to be guidance about the implications of being a family carer and a bit of a roadmap for the implications of that role. So when thinking about needs, and, and many of you will be familiar with this kind of uh, pyramid approach, I would argue that, you know, uh, in keeping with those standards, that all family carers need some level of assessment and some um, family caregivers are going to need a little bit more in terms of responding to those needs and a few are going to need referral on because their needs are beyond uh, the remit or resources that we have within our own services. So I think thinking about it in that way can be uh, can be somewhat helpful but uh, I think the key message here is that all family carers need some level of assessment of their needs and that's undertaken not in isolation but in an ongoing way. So in thinking about responding to those needs then um, I've got the analogy here of the menu and, you know, I think we do need to have, you know, a suite of options available. We can't take a one-size-fits-all approach to managing the needs of family carers and in keeping with this kind of restaurant analogy, you know, some family carers may be okay just with an entree. They might just need to, you know, access a resource like Carer Help, which I showed before. But for other carers, they may well need, you know, the whole, the full course. They might need everything we have to offer and potentially refer along to other services as well. And we need to be, as healthcare professionals, almost acting as waiters, you know, as, as is acknowledged with this quote for some carers. They're not really sure what they need. They feel guilty sometimes about accessing support. So we've got a role in helping them navigate and reinforcing um, that we actually are here to support them as well as the person they're looking after. So the challenge for many of us is, you know, that we've got an ethical obligation. If we're going to assess needs, we need to respond to those needs. And I mentioned at the start that there was a lack of evidence when I first commenced in palliative care and that landscape is changing. And indeed, that's the case in terms of family caregiver interventions and strategies as well. So how do you keep abreast of all these different options? Um, for those of you who aren't aware, I would highly recommend Care Search. Um, indeed, Care Search is a a partner on the Care Help uh, that I mentioned earlier on, and they have a repository of reviews of interventions or strategies for uh, in multiple areas of palliative care, but they have one specifically on family carers, and I recommend this highly to you. And just as an example, there on the, on the with regard to that paper on the right in palliative medicine, 
you know, I was, I was thinking, oh, let's check this out in, you know, in terms of if I'm going to be um, recommending this. And I was thinking, I wonder what's what's the latest in terms of bereavement risk assessment and very quickly was able to find this particular article. So the example, I suppose, what I'm trying to convey here is that if you're in the service, you wanted to do more in terms of family care or support, let's say it was bereavement support, we can refer to a, a search engine like Care Search and hopefully identify something that can help you ascertain what, where's the evidence in terms of uh, implementing this particular strategy versus another one. And I think this, um, this is important because having uh, evidence to support anything that you're embarking upon in terms of family support, uh, I would advocate is crucial. There is, there is a recent review in terms of bereavement interventions which actually showed that one intervention increased caregiver depression so we can't always assume that some of the things we embark upon are always going to necessarily be beneficial. But uh, I would advocate, as I said, referring to this particular um, resource. So thinking about, again, responding to the needs of carers and the potentially the, the levels um, of, uh, of need, well, there are really three, and this is adapted from Schultz from the US, at individual organisational level, and at societal level, um, and the the key thing here again is this recognition from a society level, this consumer engagement, which I touched on earlier. And I'm sorry about this um, slide's gone a bit messy, but it's a really helpful paper, and it's in terms of the individual individual interventions and strategy. And it's by G I N E X. Uh, first initial is P, uh, 2020. Um, and that GenX and colleagues uh, actually undertook a review and they were able to say in terms of family caregiver strategies at the individual level, they highlighted a few that they deemed pertinent or ready for practice, that there was enough evidence, some that were likely to be effective and some that they were, un they were unsure about the effectiveness. So it's not to say that things like, you know, art making and bereavement support groups aren't effective. It doesn't mean that definitively, it just means the research is saying we don't have enough evidence to say this is ready to roll out into practice. So it doesn't mean that they're not helpful, it just means we haven't necessarily researched those approaches yet to discern that definitively. I'm coming towards the end of the presentation now and I would um, encourage, uh, I'm hoping that for many of you, um, you're working in organisations where much of what I've provided is, is pretty much standard practice for you and perhaps this affirmation of what you're already doing, but I'm mindful that some people in the audience may be working in an organisation or a setting where there aren't systematic approaches to uh, support for family carers currently taking place. So I would argue that, this is from my perspective, that this is the bare minimum. So if you're working in that latter group, um, I would ask you in terms of for a bit of homework, maybe identify one thing off this list that perhaps you might be able to influence change in your setting to bring about some level of improvement in family caregiver support in your organisation. Uh, but as I said, I hope that for many of you, you're already doing many of these things. And if you are, perhaps you can add on to some of the other strategies um, that I've outlined or touched on today. So to bring this to a conclusion, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves that what patients want and what carers want are often quite similar. So if we're asking both those groups what's most important, the evidence is showing us that these are the things that are typically important to both patients and carers. And I would, I would maintain that I think within a, a fairly uh, rich country like Australia, uh, look, there's room for improvement in terms of of uh, family carer um, support and so forth, as I've outlined. But I would hope that we can move towards meeting many of these uh, requests from from patients and carers. And I think, in conclusion, if there's only one thing you do uh, remember from today's presentation, I would I would ask it to be this: that if you focus on improving family carer well-being nine times out of 10, by doing so, you're going to improve the well-being of the patient. And patients, if you ask them what's worrying you most, many will say that they're worried about the support and well-being of their family carers. 
uh, and they actually can deal with the implications of their own disease, but they really worry about the well-being of the family carers during their care, during their illness period, and also into bereavement. So, if we can help support family, we therefore help support uh, the person who's confronted with the advanced disease. Um, so, I really want to make sure that message comes across loud and clear. Thanks very much for listening. As I said, it was a lot of information uh, conveyed in a short period of time. Um, my email is there if you have um, subsequent questions that we can't cover off in today's presentation. A reminder that the presentation will be available to you and those references and so forth to, to, to digest at your own discretion. But thanks again for joining the webinar and thanks for um, listening to the presentation and I look forward to some comments and questions. Thanks again. Look, thank you very much, Peter. Um, it was particularly uh, interesting to see not only in the, the presentation itself, but also that reflection on many years of work in building up to um, some of the more recent uh, papers that are now starting to really unpack some of this. So it's, it's fantastic. Look, we have got a number of questions um, and we've got a few to ask. And I, I think I'll just uh, initially just go through the questions that we've got. But um, uh, a question about, uh, obviously, um, there's been a few just saying, great, thank you for a wonderful presentation, but really asking about a comment on some of the challenges that you see that arise in relationship to family support when there is, you know, a family disagreement about the objectives of care. You know, um, we often think about when uh, electively a patient wants to withdraw treatment, but the family are not ready. So really just what are your uh, comments on those sorts of challenges and the impacts? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I think that's an important acknowledgement that um, these situations do arise uh, not uncommonly where there is incongruent needs between the patient and the, uh, the family. And I think um, in most circumstances that can be overcome uh, through uh, information and communication and bring the patient caregivers together, uh, whether it be at a family meeting or if it needs to be separately, then so be it. But usually that can be overcome, but in some circumstances it can't. And I think um, uh, in palliative care we, we, we live with this um, uh, you know, pretty much every day in terms of things can't necessarily always be fixed uh, 100%. Uh, so I think that um, it does offer a challenge to us, but often um, those issues can be navigated and there may not be necessarily perfect congruence, but perhaps it's better than what it was. And I think through those trusting relationships with the team approach uh, and unpacking what might be the issue for the patient or the caregiver and talking through the options, I think commonly that can be resolved at least to a level where it doesn't cause uh, undue friction, but there are exceptions to that and I need to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, the next uh, question is really just around, and again, this might need to be a little bit broader because it, we're relating obviously to a national and international audience, but just sort of pathways of referral if you're looking for support and help for carers? Yeah, look, I think um, uh, within, I suppose, the recognition, and I touched on this before, that, you know, within specialist palliative care, uh, you know, we there are often very good resources, a multidisciplinary team and so forth, but we can't necessarily um, address everything and some families bring with them sometimes decades of conflict and issues and even within specialist palliative care, we may need to refer on to specialists that might be you know, to social workers, to psychology, to psychiatry, uh, etc., to addiction medicine in some circumstances. So even within specialist palliative care, there are limits to what we can offer. And I think if, and usually within specialist palliative care, there's a knowledge base in terms of where family carers might go to access support. Um, I would encourage for those of you who are not working in specialist palliative care settings, then I think Carer Help, uh, the resource I mentioned earlier, you just need to Google Carer Help, and again, it'll come out on the, the copy of the slide presentation. That has a large amount of resources as well um, for, for caregivers, but also uh, recognition for healthcare professionals it can be sometimes useful in getting an awareness of those. And there is the Carer Gateway, which is a national 
resource as well for generalist care is not specific to palliative care. I hope that um, answers the question. I'm not sure I have. Thank you. Just also, um, is there a sense, uh, again, this may be pertinent to Australia, uh, community palliative care, does it actually provide assistance into residential aged care to uh, work with um, people obviously in those care facilities and their carers? I missed, sorry, the last part of that, Mark. Sorry, you broke up. What was that? Uh, just checking in for do community based palliative care services not only go into residential aged care for the patient or the person, but do they actually support the carers in residential aged care as well? I, I think it's highly variable, is my understanding, Mark. So in some in some services, that's standard practice. They might be able to go into residential aged care and as part of their role in providing support to the team there within the aged care facility, they may also be supporting the family caregiver. Uh, but I think it's it's highly variable. And I know in some services that's not possible for that to occur. Uh, so I think it reflects some of the gaps that I highlighted earlier in terms of issues of equity and access. Uh, I think ideally, um, you know, we'd have a model where the staff within the, the local uh, aged care facility are equipped and are educated in the, the tenets and the, the fundamentals of palliative care and family care support and can reach out where necessary to um, specialist providers where possible for additional support where necessary. I can't speak for the other states, but there is the, the palliative care uh, state uh, consultancy line so that um, carers, uh, people with advanced disease or indeed healthcare professionals can call that number to get advice about resources uh, with regard to palliative care and indeed in, in within the aged care setting as well. Great, thank you. Um, let me see, yep. A uh, couple of questions coming back to your uh, comments on intervention programs for carers. Um, have you any sense of, or do you know what the subsequent impact of these sort of intervention programs have been on grief and bereavement? Yeah, it's um, within within our own work. Um, so there was the the one study that I mentioned where it was the nurse-led home visit where structured information and guidance was provided to the primary family caregiver at home within the context of a specialist palliative care service and those caregivers received that time alone with, with, the, with the nurse and structured information and resources and that showed that um, within via a randomised controlled trial that those caregivers actually responded um, more favourably in bereavement um, insofar as they had less lower levels of psychological distress as compared to um, their counterparts who received standard specialist palliative care. So that was at two months after the death of the person. So whether or not those effects were sustained for much longer, what we don't know, our study didn't go on um, uh, to collect that information. Um, so the other thing probably just to, to touch on that is that, you know, within, within bereavement, um, and also acknowledgement too that um, there's only going to be a proportion of people who need intervention. Uh, coming back to that point, that most people actually can identify re rewards associated with their caregiving role, uh, but there is that proportion that are at risk. And about kind of 10 to 20 percent of caregivers during bereavement are at risk of prolonged grief disorder. So I think the the issue for us is being able to systematically discern those who are at risk and then follow up for those who are through. Um, some of the standards and pathways that we've put forward and, and others have too. Um, but that would be the ideal that the, the, the interventions we convey or provide prior to death have benefits um, after death as well. That, that's the desire, but we don't necessarily know that from all the interventions that have been undertaken. There's a, a question on carer support interventions and what about reluctant carers? So. Do those sorts of interventions help maybe reluctant carers to become more engaged in caring? But is there much literature around this to support that? Gee, I, I don't know actually in terms of whether, I'm not familiar with any with any research that's actually looked at that definitively. I mean, there's been research done on, undertaken on family functioning and the, you know, the proportion of families that, you know, through you know, various validated measures don't seem to be functioning in an ideal 
uh, way necessarily and that bring with them you know, quite a bit of conflict or what have you. But I don't know there have been any ones that specifically address that particular issue. I mean, there's, there are um, ones outside palliative care um, in, you know, in terms of couples therapy and so forth. I mean, there's, there's family focus in terms of bereavement. I know there's been family focus um, uh, bereavement intervention um, and that, that um, has, there's quite a bit of body of research underpinning that. Um, but that's the only one I know off the top of my head that's been kind of specific to palliative care that's looked at that um, definitively. However, um, I think it's um, you know, a, a, a ripe area for further inquiry. It's, um, it's, you know, many of these studies, you know, are funded on um, caregivers who have actually got the capacity to undertake these, these, these research programs and be involved. So a lot of people are actually missing out on these research studies. So we actually don't know some of the benefits of these interventions because we're not we're missing out on vulnerable groups, cultural groups that have perhaps haven't been uh, involved in some of these studies. So um, there's much more work to be done in that area. Great. Thanks, Peter. And um, just asking about um, any research looking at the impact of maybe people who are trained as volunteers on care or wellbeing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure um, is, is my answer. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether there's anything being done specifically on that. Um, we fairly really find out, I think, um, but I, I don't know. Uh, whether something's been done that's focused on that explicitly. Thank you. Um, obviously, we can't get away from a presentation today without some comments on COVID lockdowns and our uh, recent events, but do you feel the support for family carers has been adversely affected and, and would you expect future research to reflect maybe dissatisfaction with um, palliative care support? Yeah, I would say so, so, Mark. I think that um, uh, we all know the implications that COVID's had. Um, there has been quite a body of research appearing uh, within the palliative care literature around COVID and the, the implications. Um, I'm aware of a, a colleague who's brought together a group of people to try and influence change in terms of, um, again, in bereavement support and recognition of the impact of COVID, trying to get more resources in place and a recognition that a lot more people are, are potentially um, suffering as a consequence of bereavement through not having um, the level of support they might otherwise have had in a pre-COVID world. Uh, but that's that's thus far hasn't been enacted. I think we've that's gone to a number of parliamentarians, but I think that's uh, we haven't had an action out of that. But the goal of that was to have more resources um, put towards supporting. Uh, family members who have looked after somebody during COVID times. Thanks, Peter. Look, um, one of the things in care diversity, care help diversity, we're, we're focusing on is the support for carers who are paid carers or or are healthcare professionals or support workers, particularly around NDIS age care. But we've got an interesting question asking about um, supporting people who work in haematology and oncology related palliative care who are experiencing burnout. Um, what's your view on um, supports being sort of moved towards this group in the healthcare system? So sorry, Mark, in terms of the support for the healthcare professionals involved yeah, in oncology? Yeah, yeah, I think particularly this is about oncology, but you could broaden it out to people who work for NDIS, supporting people at home, who um, people who are my age care carers. Um, there's a number of... I, I think in short, in short, anything that, that, that's going to help, I think, Mark, I think that, um, um, you know, we all know this this work is, is, is very, very difficult, very challenging, and particularly if people are doing it over a long period of time, and that's professional caregivers and unpaid caregivers. So the burnout rates are quite high within, um, within healthcare professionals, but also the impact, as I sort of highlighted earlier on, in terms of the long-term caregivers, can be quite dramatic. So I think anything that can be done uh, to help support the healthcare professionals or those lay caregivers who are involved in supporting uh, people regardless of the setting would be would be admirable. Um, and, you know, the, the contribution that, uh, the, that carers make to, I think it was something like $80 billion to the healthcare system or something like that was the figure quoted by um, uh, Carers Australia. So 
I think was, was an opportunity to give something back uh, to healthcare professionals and lay carers. Uh, so anything I think would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, a question about um, maybe a sort of a more sort of broader political one in the sense that um, a number of areas in society, people are asking for support for carers. Um, why should I guess we prioritise people at end of life and um, how do we get government's attention in these matters? Yeah, I think in terms of prioritising end of life care, I think, um, and some of you, this won't be familiar, this kind of an analogy, but we, we have all this effort and resources that goes into birth and understandably so. Um, you know, there's so much um, health or the healthcare dollar goes into resourcing childhood and preparation for um, parents um, but we don't have the same investment towards the end of life. Um, and, you know, I would argue that that's, uh, you know, really a, a negative score on our society as a whole um, you know, in terms of, you know, there's different ways we can rate how we look after our, our population, but um, looking after people towards the end of life, um, I would see as one of the, the hallmarks of a, you know, quality uh, society. Um, but um, I would say that, I suppose. Uh, but I think trying to convince government has been something that we've been trying collectively for a long time now since the birth of the modern hospice movement, particularly over the last probably 10 to 15 years. Now we've got that body of evidence about the benefits that palliative care can bring, not only to patients, carers, but also to the healthcare system. So the fact that palliative care is showing that from a fiscal perspective, it has some, some benefits that may have some influence. If it doesn't work on the emotions of, of government, then maybe it work on the purse strings. So, you know, we continue to applaud the work of Palliative Care Australia and the, the state groups in advocating for palliative care, but there's still so much to be done and a lot of it falls on deaf ears. Uh, but, um, you know, I do believe that we owe it uh, to, uh, to our population to invest in this area. Um, and we owe it to the unpaid carers, the lay carers that give up so much of their time and, as I said, often for many years. Great. Look, thank you. Look, um, there's still a number of comments just thanking you for the presentation today. Uh, a couple other questions, but look, we're sort of just hitting the, the end of our time. So um, I really want to say thank you, Peter. Um, thank you for the presentation today. I want to thank all the, the viewers and those in the audience today um, to joining us for the webinar. And we certainly look forward to uh, seeing people at, at our next event. Please don't forget to check out the website from Centre for Palliative Care. Um, that would be really appreciated. But also, as Peter has mentioned, with the care and help work, um, a lot of the work that people mentioned about for carers um, is very pertinent to healthcare workers as well as the, the non-trained carer as well. So uh, thank you again, Peter. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody.